Hello everyone, welcome to the class once again. I hope you are all doing good and you are enjoying learning physics with me. Now let's go ahead with the today's class. In the last class, I was talking about principle of calorimetry. I told you the heat lost by a substance will be equal to the heat gained by another substance. And we'll understand how this concept can be used to know the specific heat of an object. First of all, let us understand how a calorimetry looks like and what are its functions. Now see, a calorimeter will be generally a copper container. So let me tell you first of all what is a calorimeter. First of all, you have to take a copper container. A copper container, if you take, it will be having some mass, it will be having some specific heat. For this given calorimeter, you would be provided with its water equivalent or you will be provided the specific heat of the calorimeter. Let's say the water equivalent of this copper calorimeter is given as W water equivalent is given as W here in this case. Now, for this one, let us fill it with water. So it will look like in this way. I am just drawing water which will be contained in the calorimeter. Now, entire arrangement is actually covered. Entire arrangement is covered. So let me cover this entire arrangement with an opening. Actually, there will be two openings. One will be to record the temperature. One will be to stir the liquid uniformly. Now, there will be a thermometer which you have to place so that you can record the temperature of the substance. Here, I have placed a thermometer within this calorimeter. Thermometer, actually, its function is to tell you about the temperature, then we should also place a stirrer. This is a stirrer which will be used to actually stir the entire amount of water. This will be used to stir the amount of water so that the uniformity in temperature is maintained within the entire volume of water. So this is a stirrer. Now, why we are using a stirrer? So that the water may be uniformly distributed and its temperature is uniform. So that there will be no division of temperature within the volume of the water that you have taken. Now, for this entire calorimeter, you are provided with water equivalent that is W. Now, suppose you are given mass of water that you have taken within the calorimeter. Let's say that is M1. Mass of water that you have taken, that will be given as M1. So, you can replace the entire calorimeter with water whose mass will be M1 plus W. I told you about water equivalent. Water equivalent is what? It's the mass of water which will acquire the same amount of heat energy to raise its temperature to the same amount that I told you about in the last class about water equivalent. So, you can replace the entire arrangement with water that water mass should be M1 plus W, where W is the water equivalent of this copper calorimeter. This is how a calorimeter is made. Now see, how can we use this calorimeter? Suppose you have a substance whose specific heat is required. So what do you do? You know the water equivalent of this entire calorimeter. You want to calculate the specific heat of the substance. Let us say we have taken any substance, any substance we have taken whose mass is given as M2, whose mass is given as M2 and its specific heat is required. So we have want to evaluate the specific heat of the object. This is what is required. Now you observe this, how can we go ahead and find out the specific heat of the substance knowing about the arrangement and knowing the specific heat of water. Now see, already we are aware about the specific heat of water. It is 4200 joule per kg per Kelvin. That is what we know. And we want to evaluate the specific heat of the substance. So what you do, first of all, you should measure the temperature of this copper calorimeter. Let's say the temperature of this arrangement is T1. T1 is the initial temperature of this arrangement. Let's say T1 is the initial temperature. Let's say you have heated the copper, sorry, you have heated the substance 
to a temperature T2. So I am marking its initial temperature as T2. Temperature that has been maintained for the substance initially that is T2. Now what you do, you got the temperature of water in the copper calorimeter that is T1. You got the temperature of the substance that is T2. You bring that substance and dip in this copper calorimeter. And there will be an arrangement so that you can place the substance gradually and slowly without disturbing the external environment. Remember, there should be exchange of heat only between the substance and the water or entire calorimeter. This calorimeter cannot interact with the external environment. We are using such an arrangement so that there is no heat exchange between this copper calorimeter and the external environment. Now, let's go ahead. What we do if we bring that object the substance, we bring the substance in this copper calorimeter, what will happen? Exchange of heat will take place. Let's say T1 is less than T2. So final temperature, final uniform temperature, which will be same for object and the water within the calorimeter, let's say that is attained as T. T is the final temperature of the object and the system. So what I'm going to write, I'm going to write final temperature when the substance was immersed in the copper calorimeter that has been attained that is equal to T. So what we can write, T will be greater than T1 and T will be less than T2. That means this copper calorimeter entire with water, it would have acquired some amount of heat energy to raise its temperature and this amount of heat energy that it has gained that would have come on the cost of loss of heat, loss of heat energy by the substance. So let me write down heat energy gained by the calorimeter and let me write down the heat energy lost by the substance. So heat energy gained by the calorimeter, heat energy gained, this will be equal to mass of water that we have taken plus water equivalent of calorimeter M1 plus W multiplied with C1, C1 is the specific heat of water multiplied with change in temperature that is T minus T1 because final temperature is capital T that is greater than T1. So we have to write change in temperature as T minus T1. Let's go ahead with the next one, heat energy lost, heat energy lost by the substance that would be equal to its mass that we have taken as M2, <coughs> its specific heat let us say that is C and into change in temperature that will be T2, T2 is the initial temperature that is higher than the final temperature of the copper calorimeter that with the entire water that we have seen. Now for all these things if I am saying the next temperature that we are attaining that is T and how you are going to measure that? You are going to use this thermometer to measure the temperature and that will be also provided. We know from principle of calorimetry this heat energy gain is equal to heat energy lost. So I am writing from principle of calorimetry heat lost is equal to heat gain. This is what I have told you all in the last class. So can we write M2C T2 minus T? M2C T2 minus T is equal to M1 plus W multiplied with C1 multiplied with T minus T1, you will be obtaining this relation. Now let's proceed. I can write this value C, I can write this value C as C is equal to M1 plus W multiplied with C1 multiplied with T minus T1 we got this and divided by M2C, sorry C is what we need, so we need not to divide with C, multiplied with T2 minus T. In the entire question, in the entire thing that we are looking for to, ev to evaluate, that is C, we should know the mass of water, we should know the water equivalent of the calorimeter. We should know specific heat of water, let me tell you that is 4200 joule per kg per kelvin. I will give you that value separately also, you may note down. 
C1 is 4200 joule per kg per Kelvin. Note this value. This is also a standard value that you should know that. Now, divide with mass of the object or substance that you have taken, divide by change in temperature. So, what you should know? You should know the initial temperature of both calorimeter and the substance that we have taken. You should know the constant temperature that has been attained within the calorimeter. That is both the substance, the substance is actually immersed in calorimeter. Both the substance and the calorimeter is going to attain a uniform constant temperature that is capital T, that is what we know. So, if we know all these values, if you want to substitute it, we will be obtaining the specific heat of the object. So, can we practice question based upon this? Yes, we can definitely do that. So, let me rub this part and let me go ahead with a quick problem solving based upon this concept. I hope that it will be clear with you all how you can find out the specific heat of any object. Easy concepts we have learned. So, let me read out a question for you all. In the question, it is given that a copper block of mass 2.4 kg. So, we have a copper block, a copper block of mass 2.4 kg. Copper block has been given to us. Its mass is given as 2.4 kg. Let me mark this mass as M1, that is 2.4 kg. Now, it says that, I am reading the next line that says that, is heated in a furnace to a temperature of 500 degrees Celsius. So, its initial temperature is 500 degrees Celsius and then placed on a large ice block. Now, after heating, it is placed on a large ice block, on a large ice block. This is what that has been provided to us. Let us go ahead. The amount of ice melted is found to be 1.45 kg. Ice melted. So, let me write M2 ice melted. It is 1.45 kg. Ice melted. That is M2. That is 1.45 kg. Calculate the specific heat of copper if the heat of fusion of water is equal to 335 joule per gram. It is given that heat of fusion of water. Heat of fusion, that is latent heat of fusion, <coughs> that is expressed in terms of L, that is 335 joule per gram. 335 joule per gram, same can be written in terms of kg. So, we can write this as 335 joule, sorry, multiplied with 10 to power 3. So, you can write this as 335 into 10 to power 3 joule per kg we got and we have to evaluate, calculate the specific heat of copper. So, for here, I am also marking C of copper that is what is required. <clears throat> you heated it, you brought it on an ice block, you saw how much ice has melted. You have provided with the <clears throat> mass of ice that has been melted, you have provided with the latent heat of fusion of ice or water, latent heat of fusion of water that has been provided that is 335 into 10 to power 3 joule per kg. How can we go ahead, how we can solve it? Now see, copper block, it is kept at 500 degrees Celsius. Ice melts at 0 degrees Celsius. There will be no change in temperature that we have to take. You have to think that this ice that has been, it has brought on the block of ice, you have to take the initial temperature of ice at 0 degrees Celsius. You should not take temperature below 0 degrees Celsius, that is what is required in this question. So, first of all, heat let me write down the temperature that will be attained with the copper block. Temperature or I shall write final temperature of copper block. Final temperature of copper block that should be 0 degree Celsius. That is equal to 0 degree Celsius. So, because it is kept on ice block and some amount of ice has melted, so, its final temperature will be 0 degree Celsius. Heat lost will be equal to its mass 
m1 c delta t. We know that m1 is given as 2.4 kg. So this is 2.4 multiplied with c that is c here and multiplied with delta t. So delta t we have 500 minus 0. You get that as 500. Easily you can evaluate it. Now first of all to make the calculation simpler let me change some values. Let me take this as 2.5 kg this would be better so that we can solve the question more easily and let me keep here mass as 2.5 kg. 2.5 multiplied with 500 so you are going to get as 25 into 5 125 so 1250 C this is what you are going to obtain. This will be the amount of heat that will be lost. Now ice melts that means it is gaining some amount of heat energy. Heat gained by ice, heat gained by ice that will be how much? We know that that is equal to mass into latent heat. Mass of heat melted that is M2 into L is equal to M2 into L. So multiplied mass is here it is provided as 1.45 multiplied with 335 into 10 to power 3. The result will be in joules. 1.45 is the amount that has melted. 335 into 10 to power 3 joule per kg that is the latent heat of fusion. <coughs> Let us simplify it. So I will just write directly the value that will come out to be 4.8 into 10 to power 5 joules. This is what you will be obtaining 4.8 into 10 to power 5 joules. This will be the value of heat gained by ice. Easy term. Now we can simply use the principle of calorimetry. I told you the amount of heat gained will be equal to amount of heat lost by one of the substance will is actually going to gain, one of the substance is actually going to lose. So let us use the principle of calorimetry. So we know from principle of calorimetry, we are going to obtain from principle of calorimetry. Then amount of heat energy lost will be equal to amount of heat energy gain. So I am writing heat lost is equal to heat gained. We can equate both the two and we can write the final result. Heat lost is 1250C and heat gained is 4.8 into 10 to power 5. 4.8 into 10 to power 5, this is what we are going to get. Now simply, it is very simple for us to go ahead and evaluate. C will come out to be 4.8 multiplied with 10 to power 5 this is in joule and here I have 1 2 5 0 and the final result will be joule per kg per Kelvin. If we solve this what are we going to get? I believe that you can easily calculate this and you can write down the result. I will give you the directly the value this will be 338.8 joule per kg per Kelvin. That is what you are going to obtain 388.8 joule per kg per Kelvin. This will be the final value of the specific heat of copper that we have considered in our question. What we did, we took a copper block, heated it to 500 degrees Celsius. We saw that its temperature has risen to a very high value. We placed this copper block on an ice block. Now remember, although the temperature of ice has not been given, when it says that it's ice, you have to take its temperature to be 0 degrees Celsius. Now 1.445 kg has been melted, that means 1.45 kg you have to use as the mass to evaluate the amount of heat energy gained. And the amount of heat energy gained at the same constant temperature, that is going to mass into latent heat of fusion, M into L. Solve it, you are going to get the amount of heat energy that will be gained. Heat energy lost will be how much? That will be mass of copper into specific heat into changing temperature. As the final temperature will be acquired, that will be 0 degrees Celsius. So change will be 500 minus 0. 
go ahead solve it you are going to get 1250C. Now we equated both the two and finally we got the specific heat as 388.8 joule per kg per Kelvin. Hope that it's clear to you all. Not a tough thing to understand and we can solve more problems based upon such things. Now calorimetry seems to be very easy but let me tell you very complicated problems can be framed based upon this concept. If you know the basic thing, you have to at every step try to, try to see, try to find out how much heat energy is gained and you should also try to find out there will be one source which will be actually losing out heat energy. You have to totally evaluate how much is the heat energy lost. Then only you can go ahead and find out the, you can equate both heat energy gain to heat energy lost and whatever required from the question you can find out whether a specific heat of a substance or latent heat or vaporization of steam or something. Now I will go and go ahead and give you one more application. Suppose you want to find out latent heat of vaporization. Suppose you want to find out latent heat of vaporization using the concept of calorimetry. We know that vapor is present at 0 degree Celsius. We know that vapor is present, is present at 0 degree Celsius. Now, if I took a calorimeter whose temperature, initial temperature is T1, let's say we have taken a calorimeter whose initial temperature is T1. So, initial temperature of calorimeter, let me mark it very soon. Initial temperature of calorimeter that is T1. Let's say the mass of calorimeter is given as M1 plus W combined with the water equivalent with the water that we have taken or net mass of calorimeter. Net mass of calorimeter. I am writing its water equivalent com combined with the water mass that is M1, let's say net mass of calorimeter. M1 is not only the only mass of calorimeter, it is actually combined with the water that we have taken. So, I am writing net mass of calorimeter as M1. Initial temperature is T1, net mass of calorimeter as M1. What you did, you took some amount of vapor and you let it into the calorimeter. So, vapor at 100 degrees Celsius is let into the calorimeter. So, vapor at 100 degrees Celsius is let in the calorimeter is let into calorimeter. So, what is going to happen? Vapor is going to lose some amount of heat energy and some amount of heat energy will be gained by the calorimeter. Let us say mass is M2. Final temperature of the entire calorimeter with the steam passed, let us say this is equal to capital T. Now, what process has taken place? Try to understand. This calorimeter that we have taken, whose mass is M1, this is mass is M1, its temperature is T1. When heat is passed, its temperature rises to T. What will be the amount of heat energy gained? The amount of heat energy gained will be equal to M1, C, let us say C1 is the specific heat of water, M1, C1, delta T, this can be written as M1, C1, delta T, that will be T minus T1, quite simple. What is happening with vapor? You see here, if we talk about the vapor, here we have taken vapor. Now we know that its mass is M2, its initial temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now it has been brought, it will be converted into water at some temperature T. So what is happening? First, it will be converted into water at 100 degrees Celsius. It will be converted into water at 100 degrees Celsius, 
here we have vapor, here we have water. Now this 100 degrees Celsius water will be further, its temperature will be lowered and the temperature attained will be T. So again what I am going to do, I am going to write further, I am going to mark, let me rub this part. I believe that you would have taken down this and let me show you with the amount of water that will be left due to the losing of heat, energy and its final temperature will be T. So here in this process, the net heat that is lost, heat lost will be equal to, see M2 is the amount from here to here, the heat loss will be M2 into L. Now from here to here, the heat loss will be M2 into C1 into 100 minus T. The change in temperature, that will be 100 minus T. This is what you are going to obtain. M2 into L plus M2 C1 into 100 minus T. We have to equate both the heat energy loss, it's got heat energy gain. So what you do, take note till here, I will start from the other end that you would have taken down the heat lost and heat gained. Now if I equate both the two, we know that from principle of calorimetry, heat lost is equal to heat gained, we know that. Now heat is lost by vapor and you see this formula, heat lost is M2L plus M2C100 minus T. So I am writing here heat lost is m 2 L plus M2 into water specific heat that is C1 into 100 minus T is equal to heat gained. Heat gained will be M1 C1 and the final temperature is T, its initial temperature was T1. So T minus T1, this is what we are going to get. From here we want to require L, we want to find out the value of L. So implies that L will come out to be, you see here if I write M1 C1, T minus T1 divided by M2 plus, sorry you have to do minus, minus C1 100 minus T. This is what you are going to get, divided by M2 you will be, because M2 is here, so need not to make it in division, that will be cancelled out. This is the final formula to find out the latent heat of vaporization. Now I will request you all not to by heart these two formulas, this was just to tell you the method that we are going to apply while calculating the latent heat of vaporization or earlier we saw that while calculating the specific heat of any substance. Now we also practiced problem to calculate the specific heat of a copper block. Now let's go ahead and let's do a very simple problem to calculate the latent heat of vaporization of water. Let's go ahead, I will be doing a very simple question so that it will be very easy for you all to understand. Let me read out a question for you all. It takes 15 minutes to raise a certain amount of water from 0 degree Celsius to boiling point. So it takes time, 15 minutes from, to raise the temperature of water from 0 degree Celsius to 100 degree Celsius that is the boiling point of water. Using an electric heater, so what you are doing, you are using an electric heater to raise the temperature of water. Now after this, 1 hour 20 minutes are required in the same condition to convert all the water into vapor. Next time, this is T1 let us say, next time it is given that it is required 1 hour 20 minutes to convert the same amount of water into vapor. 1 hour 20 minutes nothing but 80 minutes. It now if the specific heat of water is 1 calorie per gram per degree Celsius, it is given that a specific heat of water that is 1 calorie per gram per degree Celsius. This is what which has been provided per degree Celsius calculate the latent heat of vaporization of water. So we need to find out the latent heat of vaporization of water. This is what is required in this question. 
Once again, I'll repeat the question for your understanding. It says that it takes 15 minutes to raise a certain amount of water from 0 degrees Celsius to boiling point. So 15 minutes, you raise the temperature from 0 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius using an electric heater. After this, 1 hour 20 minutes are required in the same condition to convert all the water into vapor. So, you are converting all the water into vapor, 1 hour 20 minutes is required. If the specific heat of water is 1 calorie per gram per degree Celsius, given that specific heat of water is 1 calorie per gram per degree Celsius, calculate the latent heat of vaporization of water. So, what is happening? Heat energy is supplied by the electric heater and that heat energy is used in raising the temperature of water and then you are actually converting it from liquid state to vapor state. So let's say let Q is the amount of heat energy provided per unit time, per unit minute sorry, per minute. Q is the amount of heat energy supplied by heater per minute, supplied by heater per minute. Let's say we have taken this as the first information. Q is the amount of heat energy supplied by the heater per minute. So in the first case, water temperature was raised from, you see here, from 0 degree Celsius to 100 degree Celsius and the time was 15 minutes. So we can write that if M is the amount of water, if M is mass of water that we have taken, so we can write mass into specific heat capacity into change in temperature that is 100 minus 0 is equal to Q into 15. This is what we will be getting. Q is the amount of heat energy supplied per unit per minute and Q is let's say we are taking in terms of calorie, Q calorie per minute. So this will come out to be from here what you can get. You will be obtaining C is 1 calorie per, per gram per degree Celsius. So M into 1 into 100 is equal to Q into 15 or Q is equal to we can write Q is equal to 100 M by 15 first information that we got, 1 calorie per gram per degree Celsius, here we got this is the value of Q. Now let us go ahead and in the next process, the same amount of steam, sorry water is converted into steam, temperature is not changing and the time taken is for water at 100 degree Celsius to steam at 100 degrees Celsius. We know heat energy that will be required that will be given as heat energy required that will be equal to M into L. We all know that. Now L is what the thing that we are looking for and this is done in 1 hour 20 minutes. So heat energy supplied, heat energy supplied will be equal to Q, amount of heat energy supplied per unit per minute multiplied with 80 and the value of Q is 100 M by 15. Let us go ahead, so from here we can write, let us say this is 1 and let us say this is 2. So we can write implies that 1 is equal to 2, so from here ML equals to Q into 80 ml is equal to q into 80 or you can write l equals to q into 80 by m l equals to q into 80 by m or we can write l equals to q into 80 divided by m this is what we are going to obtain substitute the values Q. Now Q value is 100 M by 15, 100 M by 15 multiplied with 80 divided by M. So the answer is going to be very simple, 8000 by 15. So finally let me wrap this part.
the answer comes out to be 8000 divided by 15 and the answer will be in terms of calorie per gram. This is what you are going to get because we have used all the units in calorie and the water specific heat is 1 calorie per gram per degree Celsius. This is what we will we'll be obtaining. So the final answer will be 8000 by 15. You just evaluate 15 into 5 you will get 75. 5 will be left, 15 into 3, 45. Now see 15 to 5, 75, 5, 50, 15, 3, 45. Then again 5 will be left, 50. So 533.33 calorie per gram. This will be the value of latent heat of water. Latent heat of vaporization of water. This is what we are going to get. Now I believe that you would have understood how we have done this. First of all, we calculated with what rate the heat energy was supplied by the heater. Now it was, let's say we have taken it as UQ, so Q into 15 is equal to amount of heat energy gained by water. Now that we have done. Now finally, to change it into steam, some more amount of heat energy will be supplied by the heater. It was given, the time taken was 1 hour 20 minutes, so that will be 80 minutes. So multiply Q into 80, you are going to get and equate it with M into L. You already obtained the value of Q, substitute there, you are going to get the value of latent heat of vaporization, that is this. I believe that you would have understood how to solve such questions. In the case of calorimetry, if you remember the basic principle of calorimetry, you can solve any kind of question. That is thing what is required. I am not advising you to buy hard the things, but yes, know the simple principle of calorimetry, that will be very much useful with you all, for you all. So in today's class what we learnt, we learnt about the calorimeter. We learned about how it can be used to know the specific heat of any substance. It can be used to even know the latent heat of vapor. Now we will be also, we can also know the latent heat of fusion of water also with this concept. Practice more problems, we will see how wide problems can be asked based upon principle of calorimetry. So this was all about calorimetry in the next class. I will be teaching something new that will be very interesting. So wait for the next class. Until the time, thank you everyone. I wish you all the very best. Bye-bye.